Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales, Tales from, from Outer, Outer Space. Space. I hope you enjoy. The good old war crime stick, written by the Dragon Prince. Tarashk looked at the human in disbelief. Yara, you're actually coming to help us. Of course, that's what allies do. All of the other allies of the Unify Clerk and Administration had ignored their request for help and abandoned its largest colony, Bilal Ask II, to its inevitable doom. This was understandable. Gutha Nklitki, Bilal Ask II, was considered a lost cause. The hyper-mechanized insect old race didn't often stray outside its borders, but when it did, it always went badly for whomever was in their sights. The Gutha Nklitki had one of, if not the largest and most capable militaries in the galaxy. Their navy was capable of waging war on multiple fronts against multiple star nations, and their army foot soldiers put other races' elite soldiers to shame. It was lucky for the galaxy that, most of the time, the Gunthliki were content to stay in their quadrant of space. However, where the Gunthliki did venture out into the wider galaxy, whether to address the perceived slight, acquire resources, or simply keep their scything limbs sharp, all other nations steered incredibly clear of the conflict, hence to Larashk's surprise to the offer for help. But he'd be a fool not to take up the offer to help. Perhaps the two nations together, with a healthy dose of luck, could somehow evacuate what civilians remained of Blenask too. A few hours later, in a secure station deep in Klenurk territory, Ashrank stood above the hollow projector display of Blenask's system across from two human representatives. Okay, I'm afraid we had to admit that we don't have a lot of actionable intel on the Gerenth of Litki. Keith, uh, what do you see this have? Keith Hellingstead, Grand Admiral of the Call System of Earth 7 Fleet, stared at his counterpart. Ash Rank got the distinct feeling that Keith didn't like the other human nickname for the CSE. I am not surprised to hear that your empire has produced nothing useful. Tell me, why is there any here again? Now it was Halard Malpitan's turn to bristle. Commander of the Empire of New Earth's Fourth Fleet, he had arrived just minutes after Keith. The unified Klenurk administration may have brokered the peace that ended war between these two human empires, but Ash Rank sensed that those efforts might be undone if he didn't get focus back on the reason both men were here in the first place. Gentlemen, thank you for both coming to our aid. I believe I can provide all the data you will need for strategic coordination now. If you will take a look at the hollow projector, the Gathentlichki had deployed to the Blenask system in an unconventional formation and with extreme numbers. Normally, when attempting to take the system, the attacker would bring a single formation of three to five fleets and a few armies in troop carriers. After sweeping defenses, one fleet would remain over the target world with troop carriers, while the remaining fleets would box in the hyperplane to intercept reinforcements. This time, the Gethin Tklitschki had deployed two full war hosts to a modestly sized Blodask system. A full seven fleets boxed in the hyperplane exit, four facing inwards, three covering the rear. And another three fleets sat in the troop carriers, clearly a reaction to advent of jump drive technology, which the ENE had so devastatingly used against the Voluntary Empire five years prior. The Gethin Tklitschki ground invasion force was significantly more normal fare. Three armies, three quarters of a million soldiers total. One army was more than enough to take the world within the year. So Ash Rank predicted the Blanask II would fall within the next 90 cycles. To oppose them, Ash Rank had four Klenurk fleets, all hyperpain bound, and two human fleets of unknown capability, but apparently both jump drive capable, nowhere near enough firepower. The e, e had also had an attachment of 100,000 drop troops. Hallard called them stormtroopers and pioneers interchangeably. And the CEC fleet had an attachment of 250,000 devil dogs, whatever that meant. Ashrank had seen the human dog before, fluffy and a loud little thing in the ambassador's purse. So, uh, he wasn't filled with confidence. Despite the bleak outlook, the two humans absorbed the information with good humor. Keith looked up from the data state and asked, so, Ashnak, why exactly is the Gurinthalichki armies here so feared? I've only heard disjointed stories about their capabilities, and I'd like to have a better picture on what I'm sending my boys up against. 
Ashrang's sight. Clearly, this human was underestimating the enemy and overestimating his capabilities. Humans were robust, sure, but too slow. Far too slow. Computer, access the file on the Githarilinchki warriors. Classification authorization alpha, cross-check, voice print. The computer chimed, voice print confirmed, all data available. The distinctive form of the Gurinthalichki warrior replaced the Blanark system on the hollow display. Looks a bit like a giant forearm praying mantis, doesn't it? Allard interjected. The computer continued. Raised Githinthalichki. Classification warrior class. Githinthalichki evolved in an oxygen gens world, allowing the development of large exoskeleton invertebrates without a dedicated respiratory system. Upon colonizing other worlds, the Gurinthalichki found that the oxygen density outside their home system was insufficient. This pushed them to develop intense cybernetics to mimic organic respiratory activity. Current intel suggests that the Gurinthalichki warriors are as much as 60% cybernetic. These cybernetics mesh well with the dispersed nervous system and fast twitch muscles, allowing them a great range of incredibly quick movements. Their carapaces are also enhanced with laser-resistant compounds, making them practically impervious to squad portable laser weapons. The average Kathantilichki warrior carries a plasma-resistant shield and monomolecular blade in its primary arms, while its secondary arms carry a small ballistic shield and plasma blaster. Their enhanced reflexes and extreme speed allow them to intercept both plasma bolts and conventional ballistic weapons. No race to date has been able to best them in hand-to-hand -hand combat. They are, effectively, impervious to any and all small arms. Keith crossed his arms, clearly toying with options in his mind. Hallard turned to Ashnak. Have you tried rapid-fire ballistic weapons like, uh, machine guns? Others have. They're quick enough to notice changes in the chain of spray, so only controlled sprays of even have a chance of catching them. It's down to luck. Uncontrolled sprays? Keith asked, a spark of hope in his eyes. Yes, but like I said, that's up to dumb luck. I think we can do it. We'll have to break out an ancient weapon, but the devil dogs can do it. Hallard, do you think the e and &E Fourth can pull their orbiting fleets out of position? We can buy you about two hours. I only need to get my drop pods out. Thirty minutes in and out. We'll send down some stable subdimension munition jumps, sir. Should buy the world enough time for reinforcements to get there. Ash rang startled. Wait, reinforcements? The humans laughed in sync. Disturbing. What? Did you think that we were all the help you got? Hallard asked. There is a combined human force mustering in the independent colonies between CSC and E&E. &E. We'll have full 12 human fleets here inside of six months. That's about 180 of your cycles. We'll be here to make sure the world holds until then. Dashrang felt faint. Maybe we can actually stand a chance if we can somehow double the life expectancy of Blask too. Okay, what do you need from me? The next day, Mumblin asked to, outside of Critchmelt, the planet's larger city. Mal Long stared onto the orange sky with bleary eyes. He thought he saw flashes of space combat, but there was no way to be certain. He wasn't sure the last time he saw a clear sky. He also wasn't sure the last time he'd slept more than a few hours, sometimes before the Gathentlilichki invasion, so at least ten cycles ago. Wait... They only invaded ten cycles ago. Damn. At this rate, it'll be over soon. Morlonk blinked as he saw streaks start to appear in the morning sky. Meteors? No. Too bright. Dropships! Morlonk grabbed his hand blaster and ran for his post, primary gunner of the sector's anti-air battery. And as he ran, sirens began their shrieking whines, and other soldiers started towards their posts. He hopped into the seat, booted up the targeting system, and brought his guns to bear on the lead ship. Just a few more sighs, and it would be in range. No! Molang pulled the trigger. But before any plasma flew clear, his trigger went dead. His target had flashed a warning. Friendly ship detected encrypted and credentials match. The battery's computer also sang out in the soothing way, Do not fire, friendly craft detected. Do not fire, friendly craft detected. Do not fire. Merlonk pulled the targeter off of his incoming dropship, ending the friendly fire alarm. Was it a trick of the Githanthalichki? Were we actually getting reinforcements? Only one way to find out. Merlonk stepped out of his post, staring at the incoming streaks with dozens of his fellow soldiers. For the first time in what felt like forever, they dared to hope. The waiting stretched into minutes as the dropships got closer. 
Morlunk's heart sank as he realized they weren't the right shapes, so he couldn't hear the distinctive whine of the Chilurnk dropships. But they clearly weren't Gurren the Lich Key either. Who was coming? After what seemed like an eternity of waiting and guessing, the dropship Noah, drop pod, slammed into the ground. The doors flew open, propelled by explosive bolts. Dark bipedal shapes vanned out, guns raised. They relaxed slightly as they saw the distinctive forms of the Klinurk soldiers. Colonel Robert Gild of 35 Regiment, uh, Core Systems of Earth Marines, the human saluted. He was the only soldier not carrying a long gun, just a blaster on his hip. We are the reinforcements. Who is the commanding officer here? Murlong watched as the human walked off with his commander. He didn't know how to feel. He was excited to be reinforced, of course. But what good would that do? How useful were these humans? They had brought ballistic weapons. Outdated ones, it looked like. Perhaps they were penal regiment sent to die. He trudged over to the closest human. The soldier was digging a hole behind an energy shield. His gun lay on the ground beside him. What are you doing? Digging a foxhole. Can't you see that? You're digging a hole behind an energy shield. What good is that? Shields are nice, but earth between you and the foe is better. Says who? Experience. Molang saw the humans up and down the shield line, also digging holes. I'm Molang, gunnery officer second class. Molang shook his primary appendage in the form of greeting. Brandon Waif, Corporal Easy Company, 2nd Battalion, 45th CSC Marines. He barely looked up from his ticking. I don't know what that means. It means I'm here to kill the bad guys. But that old thing... Molang gestured vaguely at the gun on the ground. This old thing has probably killed more people than your fancy energy weapons, I bet. Lieutenant Clear says that one side in Earth's First World War tried to ban this kind of gun. Called it a war crime stick. I, uh, sure? I hope it works out for you. Molonk didn't know how to handle this human, so he beat a hasty retreat to his post. Barely an hour later, systems detected a mass Geronth Lichki APCs approaching. Tank battles were not the Geronth Lichki's strong suit. APCs got the warriors in close, where they could close in for the kill. Their main weapon was a laser, useless against enemy armor, but extremely effective against the energy shields. The average Geronth Lichki warrior was more than a match for enemy armor so committing tanks to this fight would just be a waste of lives. Better to drop the shields and try blast the APCs before they closed. The Sector CO highlighted the lead Geronth Lichki APC for targeting. Tough vehicles, but maybe concentrated fire would bring it down. Molong ensured his anti-air battery was on ground fire mode and opened fire. The Githenth Lichki APCs were practically on the front line now. Molong counted five wrecked APCs, up to 60 dead Geronth Lichki warriors. A noble effort. Then again, the attack on this sector consisted of over 300 APCs. Well, over 3,500 Githenthalichki were about to flood into the sector. Facing them, 1,271 Klinurk planetary defense forces, far from elite soldiers, and a regiment of human marines. Merlong had been told they numbered about 2,000. Well, the least death by monomolecular blade is supposed to be pretty quick. The enemy was too close for friendly fire lines to engage with heavy artillery now. Molonk powered down his anti-air battery and set the dead man's switch. If he died or flicked the switch, the battery would self-destruct. That way, at least the Gerith and Lichki wouldn't be able to use it. Maybe it might even take one or two of them with it. That would be nice, wouldn't it? Go into the afterlife and get to claim one or two of the galaxy's best warriors. Might even be enough to make his father proud of his line of work. Molong double-checks the systems on his blaster. The plasma weapon wasn't likely to be extremely useful, but if he caught a Githrin to Lichki off guard, maybe he could get a killing shot in. Definitely more useful than whatever the humans were using. Molong looked over to the humans, hiding in their holes. No, not holes. A whole trench system. That's actually pretty impressive. It looked like an officer was addressing the troops. Molong strained to hear what was being said. What makes the grass grow? The human yelled. What makes the grass grow? Kill! 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 His troops shouted back. Oh, okay. The first rank of the Lichki IPC started to disgorge their contents. Looked like a few hundred warriors with the first wave. Devil dogs! New humans popped up their upper halves over the trenches, taking aim with their guns. As their Gareth Lichki warriors closed, Merlong waited for them to fire. Why weren't they firing? They're wasting precious time. Merlong held his breath. 
These poor humans were going to get slaughtered. Why weren't they firing? Just as Gorinthalichki was about to reach melee range, the humans began firing. To Murlong's surprise, there was no pinging shriek of deflecting or blocked bullets. Instead, he watched in shock as the Gorinthalichki appeared to explode in showers of chitinous bits. Barely any of them actually made it into the trenches. When they did, the marines pulled back and continued to hammer them with the primitive-looking weapons. Just what the hell were these humans using? Combat lasted barely ten minutes before the Gurinthalichki retreated. Dozens of APCs littered the battlefield, unharmed, but with no one to pilot them. At the end of the day, the Gurinthalichki dead count was over 1,800, over half of the attacking force. A few dozen humans had been killed, and another few hundred had been wounded. Most of them were missing limbs for near misses by monomolecular swords. Molonk didn't think that he could survive a hit like that. No Klinurk had been killed. Molonk hunted down Corporal Waif. The cranky man was leaning against a rock, breathing through some sort of lit tube. What the hell kind of weapon are you using? I thought nothing could get through the Gerontolichki shield. This uh, is a 12-gauge shotgun, Lodo Double Art Buck. Command says they can deflect bullets, but uh, Batty here puts out nine pellets at once. Can, uh... Can I have one? Sure, we bought another three million down with us. I'll show you to the supply dump. End of story. I would quickly like to thank the T5 channel members and Patreons. Casper Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, Lord Azrakal, It's Difficult to Pronounce, Dragzoon WRE, Holly's Sister, Arcadian. Thank you very much.